Kia ora koutou. Ko Tiffany Taku Ingoa, he kairuruku taufainga aho ki Manaki Whenua. Good afternoon everyone, my name is Tiffany and I am the Events Coordinator at Manaki Whenua Landcare Research. Before I hand over to Sam, I'm going to run through a couple of technical slides to ensure that your experience with us online today goes as smooth as possible. If you have joined us previously for a webinar session, you can ignore me for the next minute. You will notice you have a control panel at the side of your screen. If at any time this collapses, you can bring it back by simply clicking the orange arrow button. If you are having sound issues and you can see my mouth moving but cannot hear a word I'm saying, please grab the PDF in the handout section and this has instructions to resolve this quickly. The audio panel is where you can control where the sound plays on your computer. Select the drop down arrow and choose your audio output. During the presentation, you may have questions that you want to be covered in our Q&A session. You can do this via the chat panel throughout our session today. You will notice it is pretty small and it will be hard to read other attendees' questions. Select the pop-out icon on this panel and drag the corner out to make it as big as you want. You can also use this feature if you are having technical issues and ask me any questions. Questions asked by the audience show as anonymous and a green colour in the chat panel. However, please note we will use your name in the Q&A session. If I respond to you regarding a question, this will show as read. Now over to Sam to introduce you to our seventh session for the Biosecurity Bonanza series. Kia ora koutou. Welcome to the third talk in our Mammal Pest series for Biosecurity Bonanza 2020. It's my pleasure today to introduce Dr Janine Duckworth, a Mammal Biocontrol Scientist at Manaki Whenua. In autumn 2018, a new strain of rabbit hemorrhagic disease called RHDV1K5 was released in New Zealand to improve the efficacy of RHDV-based biocontrol of rabbits. In this talk, Janine is going to tell us about the spread and persistence of K5 and the original Czech strain released in 1997, as well as another type of RHDV called RHDV2 that has recently been identified in New Zealand. She will outline current knowledge and the likely impacts of the different strains. This work was developed from concerns about increasing rabbit numbers from local farmers and representatives of the rabbit coordination groups. A Q&A session will follow this talk. I encourage you to submit questions during the presentation. We will try and get through them all, but if not, Janine will respond by to any questions we don't get to. I'll now hand over to Janine to share her presentation on rabbit biocontrol, changing impacts of RHDV viruses. Kia ora. Uh, it's my pleasure today to talk about our work that on rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus. This work would not have been possible without the um, support of a lot of people, including a lot of field staff. Today I'm going to talk um, also about some of the modelling work that we've done and also um, some of the lab um, out findings. I think a lot of us are aware of the problem rabbits have been in New Zealand. Um, they were introduced in the 1830s and they've had periodic epidemics ever since then, from the 1880s right through to the 1980s was the last large one. In the 1980s, this resulted in the development of the rabbit and land management program and that used toxins to control rabbits quite successfully until the mid early 1990s when user pay user pays was introduced and rabbits were no longer controlled quite so successfully. So in 1997 uh, the RHDV1 check strain arrived in New Zealand and if you look at the timeline on the bottom of the graph you'll see that uh, this resulted in a suppression of rabbit numbers for many years and with minimal costs and minimal efforts for farmers. However by 2007 they were again there was again increasing concern about rabbit numbers and uh, we were and, it, and this the numbers continued to grow. There were several op op uh, options investigated and it finalised with, in 2018, a new strain called RHDV1K5, which was released na nationwide in March. At about the same time that K5 was released, the 2018 um, RHDV2, a new strain, which we don't know how it arrived, was also found in New Zealand. So in New Zealand, we've actually got what we call four genotypes of RHDV. We've got 
two of the RHDB1 strains, that's the Czech and the K5. We've got the new one, which was discovered in 2017-18, RHDB2. And we've also got a benign strain. And the benign strain um, was only characterised in 2016, but we've known it's been here and for many years and at least since the 1980s. They're all rabbit khaleesi viruses with a similar structure, but they all have, because they're different, um, they belong to different families and each family has different phenotypic characteristics. For instance, the benign strains are found in the gut and they don't cause any harm to the animals, but they do provide a kind of cross-protective um, protection like a um, vaccine against the Czech strain. But uh, K5 was selected because it was felt that um, it could overcome the, uh, the protection provided by this benign strain. And RHDV2 is a com another completely different genotype. It affects different populations of animals and has a different range of lethal um, characteristics. I'll talk a bit more about all of these as we go through this, the talk. Just want to talk about the RHDB1 release. Um, we had four science sites, sites, two in Canterbury and two in Otago. Uh, I've talked about these at previous talks, but I'm just going to go through what we had at each science site. At each science site, we had a release site, which was called Ground Zero, and a um, hundred, sorry, a 500, um, Meters from the ground zero, we had a ring of uh, fly traps, um, and then outside of that, within five kilometers of the original release site, we had camera traps, fly traps, and uh, at known satellite populations of rabbits. So basically, we were able to look at the rabbit populations within five kilometers of our release site, and we also did nights and spotlight counts pre and post treatment, just to see how the virus was spreading and what its impacts were. This, that stylized version, actually in real life, um, this is a, a real life one in Glentana. And here we have the ground zero type, which is the green um, boxes, um, surrounded by those, a circle of yellow. Those were the initial set of fly, um, fly traps. And then you've got yellows going from top to bottom, which are the um, satellite surveillance sites. The pink squares that you can see were actually where we recovered carcasses. And this was repeated at the four sites, with depending on the topography of the site um, in, at the four sites in Canterbury. What we were able to do was we were able to use a new multiplex RT-PCR technique where we could look at our rabbits carcasses or in this case also fly samples and in a single assay um, we could see the different strains. We could see the K5 strain, then we could see the RHDV2 strain, we could see the Czech strain and then we could see the Chinese strain and they and and they could come out as a, in a single assay, we could determine which of the strains were present in each of the samples. And this technological advancement has been very helpful. What we found at the four science sites is we recovered over 60 carcasses in all, but only 43 of those carcasses we included in our analysis, because some were very old and others had obviously been shot. Um, what we found in the carcasses was that RHDV check was present prior to release. And we also found that carcasses were very hard to recover. Lots of predators were present, cats and ferrets and hawks. Post-release, we um, the carcasses were about 64% of them were K5 and 36% of them were the Czech strain. We found carcasses at all the sites, but not at Ida Valley, but we found um, RHDV1 K5 present in the flies at all the sites. And I'm just gonna talk a little bit more about the flies. So the fly trap was baited with minced liver and lined with a plastic acetate sheet. We collected the flies and changed the acetate sheet lining the inside of that fly trap every three to four days over the eight weeks of the intensive monitoring period. The acetates were then um, swabbed with a cotton bud and these were put into a RNA preservative and they were analysed. And this gave us a set of data that allowed us to detect whether the flies had um, RHDV present. If we look at these two um, 
examples. On the left side, we have a, a set showing <coughs> strong bands at one position. These represented the existing K. Um, this is these represented the existing check strain, and that was one week before the K5 release. At the same site, three days after the K5 release, we now have two two bands. One, the top one is the check, and the three bands below are are the um, are the K5. The multi band in the middle, they're just the markers telling us which um, strain they correspond to. So it's very clear that in this season when we released K5, and it was a very unusual season in that there was a lot of feed around, it had not, there'd been a lot of rain, there had been a quite a significant um, uh, RHDV1 outbreak of the check strain immediately prior to when we did the K5 release. But after the it was only after the release, of course, that we could see the two, um, the two strains were present. So what does this look like? Um, basically, if we had we had we had twenty we had twenty fly traps at each site, and looking at the top one at Glen Tanner, you can see that prior to the release, um, the black line which represents the check was present in almost all the fly traps on both occasions. Um, this grey line below is negative of the negatives. The green line is. RHDV2, which was very seldom observed, um, and we think actually they were probably mainly false positives. However, if we look at um, the time after the K5 release, we start to see K5 in the fly um, samples as shown in the red line. And um, simil the similar pattern was seen at Mount Hay. So Mount Hay, even a higher proportion of the traps contained at least one sample of check, and um, in several of them also had um, K5 present. If you're wondering why at, at about week three to week four after release, we had a whole lot of negative samples, that's because it snowed at Glen Tanner and fly activity dropped right away. Um, however, we can see that K5 was there um, in, at both sites and persisted up to six weeks. But by the time we got to 45 weeks after the release to the far um, right at both sites, um, we could no longer detect K5 or very little. And there was a, an indication that there were some samples which actually had true positives for RHDV2. So this has given us a good idea of being able to assess what viruses are present in what areas at what time. It also allowed us to look at how the K5 had moved across the um, landscape. So we calculated that the time that K5 was first recorded at each of the fly traps away from the release sites. And these could be up to five kilometres away. Um, and that allowed us to look at the individual virus movements. What we found is that virus movements varied greatly. In some places um, we could see no movement in any of the directions and others we could see up to 700 meters a day. Over, overall if we looked at the average rates of spread from our four sites we can see they averaged about the virus moved about three and a half kilometers per month but in some individual sites there were very high rates of spreads at individual times between about nine and a half to 20 kilometers the virus moved in a month equivalent of a month. Now these, this is for the fly traps. If we looked at the carcasses, the furthest movement we detected at a regional site was 25 kilometres in 21 days, um, and that was that's a, an even faster movement. But it was quite rare. And what we found was we weren't getting enough carcasses from our um, sites to get a good um, idea of how far the virus was moving using carcasses, but we think we have got a, um, an indication of how far it moved by looking at the movement of the fly. How did that look like as impacts? So six months after, six weeks after we released it, we had done um, night counts prior to release at each of the sites and we'd done post release. So there were moderate numbers of rabbits present at all sites, there's a bit of variation. And after the um, night count, post-release, we saw 
reductions between 12 to 61 percent in the different sites and these reductions group could represent impact of K5, impact of check, any shooting, any traditional control. Some places we didn't have good control over that but in general what we saw was that um, the, at all of these sites there was a moderate to high immunity present in the um, and that, that the rabbits had antibodies against uh, the check the RHDV1 and what we found is that when we got the highest reduction of 61% was corresponded to the lowest immunity and that is in keeping with um, previous um, values. When we looked at the regional night counts in Canterbury and Otago, the results were very much the same. In Canterbury, they looked at across 129 kilometres of transects and the average reduction was 40%. This compared very similarly to, this, um, to the science sites at 37. On a property basis, it ranged incredibly from zero to 70%. And this ref reflects the immunity of the population <coughs> in, in those areas, as well as the impact of check at that time. Otago had very similar results at their monitoring sites. On a property basis, it could numbers decrease from zero to 80%, but on average, it was 36 to 47 percent. If we wanted to know well what are these reductions due to, which which virus was most likely to be impacting, at the time that these um, <coughs> sites were monitored, the wild rabbit samples that we collected from councils and the public, about two-thirds of them again were due to K5 and about a third due to check. About that time we found a couple that had um, of RHDV2. So the outcomes of the um, K5 releases, we got a 30 to 40% decrease in night counts and two thirds of the deaths were associated with K5. What we found about the rate of spread, um, the virus spread at about three to four kilometres a month on average, but was much larger distances in some places. Now this was slower than we had expected. We had designed our release strategy expecting about seven kilometres per month. This was based on Australia, which had 20 to 100 kilometres per month, and Spain, which had 12 to 15 kilometres per month. We thought that Spain would have been similar, more similar to New Zealand than Australia, and in Australia, <coughs> as in all places, we couldn't discount how much was person um, transport moving the virus around. But, but and to be on the conservative side, when we set up the release strategy, we um, selected we estimated would be about seven kilometres per month. So about 20 kilometres we spread across the three months. And that was the recommendation to try and, um, if you were going to release, look for sites within about 20 kilometres of each other, or sites which had very high rabbits of numbers. And that's how the sites were generally selected. The other thing is, it's not necessarily unexpected. Remember that we had widespread and active infections of RHDV1 check present at these sites. So K5 was not going into a naive population. In fact, it was going into a, a very, um, a very a, a population that had been actively um, exposed to RHDV1 immediately prior to the K5 release. So again, looking at that whole year, this is from December 17 through to November 18. If we look at the left-hand side with the red bars, that's the K5 release. We saw it um, in the, this is for all the rabbits, wild rabbits that were collected. And K5 was there, but it doesn't appear to have persisted to any great degree. There was just a couple of samples found um, in that November. However, if we look at the samples, we see the RHDV2, <clears throat> six months after the K5 release, RHDV2 was ex exceptionally ex active um, in these areas. Now, the samples that are represented by RHDV2 are primarily, but not always, but they're primarily from the Otago region. And this is a problem that we've been having with this um, research, is that we, we can't always get a a representative sample of carcasses from across um, the country. For instance, there are no samples in there from the Mackenzie country. They just weren't able to be provided to us. If we look at this across the two years, what's happened since then? Um, so 
K5 is again, it, it's the same graph to the left, and then we've extended it out for another year. Um, what we're seeing is that check remains active, the black um, columns, and about 50% of all the samples we've received have been um, the original strain check. We see a little bit of K5, but a lot of those samples are actually people biocide operations, I, I believe. And we are seeing RHDV2 popping up, and I suspect RHDV2 is um, continuing to move through the country and is popping up quite a lot. Basically, check is still dominating, but I think RHDV2 will um, continue to spread. And um, at this stage, they are both persisting together. We've used this data to look at it to develop a three strain model for rabbit Khaleesi viruses. Now, this is quite a complex model based on a kind of when following how rabbits get infected with the virus, recover for the virus, and whether and whether they're susceptible or not. And um, Celia Ariente has developed this. You're looking at three strains: the Czech strain, the K5 strain and the benign strain. The reason we put include the benign strain is because we, it is, the Australians um, found that it was provided cross protection against the Czech strain, but not against the K5 strain. So we were, um, and that's what we thought would give K5 as advantage. This um, model includes the seasonality of rabbit productions. It, if you look at the two graphs at the bottom, it, look, it includes the relative fly abundance over the um, time and it looks at um, and it uses that as an indication of transmission uh, rate for the viruses so because when we look into our meta populations within a population of rabbits if we look at them across the landscape there will be quite a lot of rabbit to rabbit transmission within a population but for populations between but for virus movements between rabbit populations um, the flies play a very important role. These are, um, this model takes this into account. Some rabbits are susceptible, those are the white. Some of them have been are actively infected and some have recovered and are now immune. And her model um, take, is able to take these into account. She first ran it as a spatial model with two strains, looking at what the effect of um, of the benign strain had on the check. And what she found was that um, if an animal had been exposed to the, um, the um, RCVA1, the benign strain, then um, it was protected, it was somewhat protected. And, and in that situation, she expected to see persistent disease with annually occurring outbreaks, but a population suppressed about 30% of the pre-RHDV densities and an average seroprevalence of 30%. This fitted well in with the um, field results and the results from Barlow. She's since gone on to develop that further, but not, not only including the benign strain, the check, and, but also K5. And what her modelling has predicted is that if um, K5 can overcome that, um, that uh, resistance, where, where it becomes zero, K5 would replace check. If K5 and um, check have similar um, uh, protectiveness, they would probably coexist. But if K5 um, was not better than uh, check, then we expected K5 to go extinct. This is because check was already well established and the, um, the, the strain would not be able to establish successfully. She, Cecilia's still working on these models and we're just using more field data and looking at some of the, um, the rabbit, the fly movements of the virus as well as some rabbit susceptibility testing that we're doing in animal challenge models to, to finish this work off and that's, um, that's in progress now. So going forward, K5 has not persisted in um, the wild situation as far as we can tell but it, we know it's worked well as a biocide in peri-urban and semi-rural areas. There have been several cases been, um, where it's been released in um, areas where you can't use other methods of control, um, and especially areas which have not had continual outbreaks of RHDV. So these are things like around cities and where rabbit numbers are moderate, not 
extremely high. Um, it, it certainly it does quite a good job. Sort of places that we're seeing uh, that um, is in the urban areas in Christchurch. It's, there's been a couple of releases and they've worked well. We're still trying to check for sure which are the persistent strains. Um, we we especially between Czech and RHDV2, and we've now got the ability to use fly surveys to look at that. And but we still need to have a better understanding of how the new strains are affecting the rabbit's susceptibility and immunity. And a big problem with that is RHDV2 we have in New Zealand is different to the strain they have in Australia. We have a lack of knowledge on how lethal this particular strain of RHDV2 is and what sort of cross protective immunity it provides and also whether it can overcome some of the immunity to um, particularly the Czech strain. This, all of this work has highlighted the complexity of rabbit control and management and it has also highlighted how important it's been to have a national coordinated and ongoing partnership with the um, members of the rabbit coordination group with dealing with different approaches to these rabbit issues. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Oh, before I do, of course, I should acknowledge all the field team um, that from Manaki Whenua, the rabbit coordination groups and its component membership, the landowners, of course, who provided access and local knowledge, and the contractors and members of the public who provided some of the carcasses. We couldn't have done this work without the expertise from the Australian research teams and advice and also our funders, including MPI, the Sustainable Farming Fund, and, and MB. Thank you, I'm happy to answer any questions. Hi Janine, thanks for a, a very interesting talk. It's nice to see it all pulled together. Uh, we've got a few questions to get through. So Bo has asked, is interested to know more about the RHDV1 Chinese strain and RHDV2, and do you think now that it's widespread and are there any plans to release either into the landscape? So the Chinese strain is a RHDV1 strain that arrived in Australia several years ago. It has not had a great deal of impact in Australia and we wouldn't be expecting the same there. It's a rabbit, rabbit tree, like um, domestic rabbit type strain. And um, my advice is the K5 was also a rabbit a domestic rabbit strain. We may be better to be looking to locally adapted strains from wild type viruses um, um, rather than look towards the Chinese. The RHDV2 um, Australian strain, we don't know. We just have very little understanding about how our, we know it's not the same strain, it's a more European strain than the um, Iberian strain that the Australians have got and we just don't know. RHDV2 can be quite variable. It, some strains are 25% lethal and some strains are 75, 80% lethal. And in the New Zealand case, we're not sure where this sits. It certainly is quite lethal, but it's not giving us the huge die-offs that we saw in 1997. So it, um, there's still quite a lot of questions to answer. Whether we should bring them in, there is um, there are risks to bringing them in unless they come through um, proper channels, and um, um, and there are huge expenses in bringing in each new strain because they have to be um, not only um, they have to be safe to come in because rabbit, Australia has diseases that we don't want in our rabbits and we don't want in our other livestock. So Brent Glentworth would um, like to hear your thoughts on why K5 did not persist in the environment. Mm. So I'm still running the rabbit challenge trials with K5 and seeing how important the benign Khaleesi virus was for its spread. Um, I haven't got a clear picture to share with you yet, but um, we have a different strain of benign virus in New Zealand, maybe that was the difference. Um, but Australia, it hasn't persisted too well either there. K5, as I said, came from a rabbit tree. I do wonder if we um, there is something about field adapted strains that would have made a, um, which, which might have made survivorship better for these viruses. We, in 2012, we looked at a whole lot of wild strains in New Zealand and we found a strain that we thought might have potential to be more um, deadly. It killed faster than them. 
some of the other existing field strains and we were wondering about using that as a new biocontrol agent um, until K5 came along and now RHDV2 has come along. But that strain that we identified in the wild has since spread right throughout New Zealand and has been the dominant check strain for the last uh, six years. So that was a field strain and I just wonder if this field adapted strains might have been a um, may have some advantages that strains found in um, domestic rabbit trees don't. I hope that answers the question. So Glenn would like to know, can the blood serum tests now determine antibodies from each strain? No, we there you cannot from antibodies tell you whether you've got antibodies if it's K5 or check. You can tell the difference between benign and the pathogenic strains, all three. You cannot tell you can tell the difference between RHDV1 strains and RHDV2 strains, but it's a very complex test. It takes um, three to four times the amount of analysis that um, these simple commercial tests that we have at the moment. At the moment, Ag Research can provide us with a test about whether an animal's been exposed to RHDV1 or RHDV2. Um, it's it's um, they are both um, react with uh, that test, but they can't tell you whether it's RHDV2 or RHDV1 at the moment. Um, the, the testing to differentiate between these different um, variants and genotypes is, is just, um, it's in early days and it's just not available on a commercial level at this stage. So Peter Visser has asked, are the recommendations read conventional control methods in association with K5? Uh, he's heard a number of landowners questioning the recommendations from biosecurity staff, from councils, not to do anything and to give the virus a chance. I think um, if you're in an area that hasn't had RHDV2 go through, or is it going through now, so we know anecdotally that there's quite a lot of um, we suspect there's RHTV2, RHDV2 is active in some areas at the moment. Um, I would agree with the council to let the RHDV2 go through um, and do it, and then take advantage of that drop to go back in with your conventional control. If RHDV2 has been through or um, hasn't seemed to have affected your property, then um, at this stage, then um, then I would talk to your biosecurity advisors and um, and it may be time to reconsider um, some conventional control. Just remember that um, RHDV, um, RHDV1, the check strain, it, we, we want to encourage it to have its, um, we want to encourage it to have its outbreaks in autumn because there are a few animals that are too young at that stage. So let's Let's go back a step. Animals that get ex exposed to RHDV1 at a very young age don't get um, killed by the virus, but they get lifelong immunity. So they are your source of immune animals. So in the ones in spring, if you get RHDV1 go through then, then you end up with a lot of immune youngs, immune animals. If it happens in or in in autumn, then the animals are now old enough and those young the springborn ones would be susceptible if they hadn't seen the virus before. Um, if so yeah, so basically you'd really like to have your outbreaks in autumn if you can. However, you don't have a lot great deal of control over that. Um, and if you have had continual outbreaks of RHDV1 through spring and autumn, a lot of your animals will already be immune. RHDV2, the word is that it can partially overcome some of that susceptibility, but not all the animals die. And we don't know if that's because RHDV2 just doesn't kill, kill all the naive animals or if RHDV2 can only kill some of the immune animals. It's quite a complex situation. I'll be happy to try and answer it to, um, Mr. Visser offline if that would be helpful. So Bo has asked, is K5 available as a biocide for urban areas as mentioned or is this for research only? So 
If you want to talk about the use in peri-urban areas, you need to talk to Canterbury um, Envir Environment Canterbury, and they they are the the source of the um, K5, and you need to have a discussion with them about um, uh, getting access and what would be the best way to um, use it. If um, yeah, so it's not commercially available, as in you can't just go up and knock on a door. But um, Environment Canterbury has stocks, and um, and if you go through your regional council to talk to Environment Canterbury, then that's the best route to get access to the K5. Great. Uh, from Angus McKenzie, he'd like to know how you rate the overall success of the K5 release. Well, the K5 release as a release was extremely successful. The regional councils, they got their people organised, they um, they really did um, gather the troops and get them there and it was very well coordinated operation. K, the K5 release was complicated by the fact that Czech strain was extremely active that year, um, but um, we weren't to know whether K5 was going to persist or not and, um, and with no way to test that unless we do, did the release. I think K5 was unlucky to be released at that particular year. It might have had a better chance if there hadn't been so much check strain around. But the actual release itself um, as a logistical um, process went extremely well. It did give us a hit and, um, it, and we knew it was never going to give us a 90% reduction like we'd seen in the past. Um, we, we, it gave us that 30-40% um, reduction that we had a, and we had signaled would be the likely impact. Um, and that, and we felt that then it was up to really people to try and take advantage of that hit. We've had two very unusual seasons of rabbit breeding since then. And, um, uh, and, and so the overall outcome may not have been as quite as successful as we'd hoped, but that was, um, that's the problem with working with rabbits in a unpredictable climate. So Graham Hickling has asked, do the models make any predictions about how the benign strain prevalence will change in future years? Okay, so we kind of know that the benign strain prevalence has changed. Um, when they first did the work in 1997, about 6% of the animals were indicated to have a benign strain prior to the release of check. And now that is up to 50% um, on average. And in some places it's 100% of the, of the population in an individual place has the benign strain. And I think that's a good indication that the benign strain has been offering some advantages. Um, as I said, we're just doing the animal challenge trials at the moment and um, um, the, and, Yes, yeah, and so we don't really know what how it relates to check, and we know nothing about um, RHDV2 and its relationship to the benign strain. My guess from the Australian workers, I've never mentioned benign strain having any cross protection against RHDV2. So um, I think RHD, the benign strain will persist if, if check strain persists, but it's possible it may not be such an advantage if RHDV2 is not is not affected to, um, if prior exposure to the benign strain does not confer an advantage to an animal that is subsequently exposed to RHDV2. Great, uh, so John Innes would like to know, has anyone looked at the cost effectiveness of Khaleesi so far, the actual costs versus actual gains? Um, yeah, no, not in a formal, yes and no. So for the K5 results, no. The results are just still coming in. We've, um, it's something that could be done in the future. Um, for the rabbit Khaleesi virus, um, yes, there have been several attempts to try and um, determine what the bio, um, the bio control versus the economic gains have been, and they've always been quite positive um, and also the ecological gains have always been extremely positive. So after um, 1997, the use of 1080, for instance, dropped from 10 tonne per annum to just a few hundred kgs. 
of the active ingredient. So, I mean, that had some big benefits if you were looking at um, reducing toxin use. If you were looking at it at the moment, um, it's hard to say. It's been very unusual seasons. We've had breeding seasons um, the last two years that have been exceptional. And I suspect we're still having one at the moment because we've had no, uh, we've got a reduced winter weather. In places where RHDV2 is particularly active at the moment, um, uh, I think there, are, there will be gains, but it's never been done as a case study as yet. And I'm not sure that um, we have a good enough understanding of RHDV2 and enough field data to say, um, to be able to quantify that properly at the moment. Great. So this is the final question for the session. And Bruce Warburton would like to know if you give rabbits enough RHDV, can it overcome immunity? Ah, it's a good question. Um, I've had discussions with some of my Australian colleagues, and they say they suspect yes. Um, it's one of the things that we're wanting to try um, in the future to see if we can um, use this as a biocide. Um, as a dosing result, but I haven't got the results at the stage, and I we COVID has kind of re, reduced progress in some of these areas. But um, yes, in theory, yes, but um, we haven't got any um, good uh, practical um, proof of this um, ability to overcome those um, the immunity by using very high virus challenges. Great. Well, thank you very much, Janine, for an excellent talk. Um, and thank you for everyone else at home who's joined us today. And we look forward to seeing you tomorrow for Andrew Gormley's talk on trap simulating. Ta -da.